but I actually grew to sort of love doing them at home. I might come up at like 4 p.m., turn on some music, get out a huge glass of water, pour all the samples out, and I call it getting intimate. What music you turn it some, on? Some candles. R&B. Caressing sample A. <laughs> This is Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon, bringing to you the best in news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. And I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman. So if you've been to Kentucky, then you have probably stopped at one of the many liquor barn locations spread across the state. It's a cornerstone for bourbon buyers, even such as myself, for very many years. But now Liquor Barn has been acquired by GoPuff, and we get a chance to sit down with Brad Williams, He's the Senior Category Manager for American Whiskey for all of GoPuff brands. And we talk about what it's like to manage all American Whiskey brands and the a multitude of barrel pricks across all the geographies for the brand families of, say, Liquor Barn, BevMo, and 400 other regional GoPuff locations. Needless to say, it's a lot of whiskey math and figuring out where barrels are going to go based on the right markets. Brad gives us an insight into keeping customers excited. What happens when a barrel pick flops and people just aren't happy with it? And where he sees buying trends happening. But with that, enjoy this week's episode. And now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from Max, or at A-O-X-A-M-A-X-O-A, who writes me on Twitter. Is it common to have a general preference for small batch over single barrel in general, or just like some people like single barrels over others? Well, that's a great question, Max. And in fact, I do think this is a preference situation. If you like consistency, if you're someone who wants to taste the same thing today as you did three weeks ago, or at least in the ballpark, then small batch is usually where you like to reside. Because here's the thing. They have a profile that they are trying to meet when they are batching every single time. And I've sat on a lot of those, a lot of those meetings where they are batching a bunch of uh, barrels together and like, all right, this is Larceny, this is Booker's. You know, they want to keep it tight in that flavor profile. It may be a little different. It may uh, vary from release to release, but it's still within, I would say, five degrees. Whereas a single barrel, like, you can't find a better example than Henry McKenna, which Henry McKenna, which I know all too well, won World's Best Whiskey at San Francisco World Spirits Competition a few years ago, and that kind of blew off the shelves. And people would be like, oh, my God, how did this win Best Whiskey? It's a single barrel. And, like, the, the barrel that we tasted may be better than the, the one that someone bought in the store. So single barrels are, by definition, inconsistent because no two barrels yield the exact same flavor. And so I think single barrels are those who are on a journey, who are on the journey to find that inconsistent flavor. They, they like it, but they want to be challenged. So if you're a, someone who likes consistency, small batch is the way to go. But if you like the challenge of inconsistency, sometimes you're going to like a bottle, sometimes you're not, then the single barrel is for you. But that is a great question, Max. Thanks for hitting me up on Twitter. If you would like to be like Max, hit me up on Twitter. Look for my name, at Fred Minnick. Until next week. Cheers. Do you ever pour yourself a bourbon, swirl it around, and then start struggling to come up with tasting notes? And perhaps you're also looking for a good Father's Day gift idea. Well, you can now solve both with a kit from Nose Your Bourbon. And unlike other nosing kits on the market, Nose Your Bourbon kits feature real ingredients for the most authentic aromas. You can smell real Tahitian vanilla bean instead of some synthetic aroma that's just made from chemicals. So head on over to noseyourbourbon.com and enter code BP10 for 10% off your order. Play Whiskey Wednesday Round 11, The Memory Game. Until June 26, each week you can win one of our 12 incredible grand prizes. Select two doors at checkout, and if they match on drawing night, you'll win that bottle. Not a match? No worries. You still score a Weller 12-year. Every $5 ticket gives you five chances to win, including four weekly bonus prizes. Get your tickets now at give270.org. Charitable Gaming License ORG 0002703. Ed Bly and Rising Tide Spirits are back again with a new release of Old Stubborn Bourbon. 
And this release of Old Stubborn is a premium hand marriage of 10, 11, and 12-year cask drink, barely filtered pot still bourbon. It comes in at a staggering 123.8 proof. And the flavoring grain for this one, which the last one was weeded, but this time it's now rye. Rich, sweet, and bold with a long finish that's sure to be another eye-opener. You can order online at Sealbox or TheBourbonConcierge.com, and you can even purchase in person at Revival Vintage Spirits, and even now with very few select stores in Kentucky. You can get it now while you can, but be sure to do it because it's not going to last long. From their bar to yours, Chad and Sarah of the popular YouTube channel It's Bourbon Night bring you their favorite at-home old-fashioned mix with the new Elemental Elixir's Golden Hour Syrup. It's a custom-made syrup with notes of bold black tea, warm spices, and orange zest. All you need is your favorite whiskey and ice. No bitters needed. One bottle makes 16 drinks, so that's only $1 cocktail before you add your own whiskey. They can also be enjoyed in other cocktails or spirits, mocktails, coffee, tea, and anything you can think of. It's crafted locally in Lexington, Kentucky, and you can get your bottle now at whiskeyambitions.com. Always find what you love at Total Wine & More. With so many great bottles to choose from at the lowest price, it's easy to find your favorite Cabernet or a new single-barrel bourbon to try with some help from one of their friendly guides. And with every bottle comes the confidence of knowing you just found something amazing. With the lowest prices for over 30 years, find what you love and love what you find only at Total Wine & More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Spirits not sold in Virginia and North Carolina. Drink responsibly and be 21. Welcome, everybody. We're back with another episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny, Ryan, and Fred, all here mm -hmm. today. All right. We're all together. I'm so happy when we're, we're all together three together. again. It's the, the camaraderie is there. The banter is there. And we're always waiting on Fred to get started. It's, it's okay. You know, 24 <laughs> minutes late, but we're here. We're hey, going. listen. <laughs> I, I was out there doing the fine work. True, true the, author okay, style. Finals. No deadlines. <laughs> it is true. Like, you know, you're tight. When you, when you write a book and you get successful, they... Your literary agent tells you, like, okay, you can never show up to a meeting on time because then that makes them wonder why you're not. You start thinking, you, you like, think you're not important enough. Is yeah. That they, it is? And, and so, like, you own the meeting when you show up. And I kid you not, that was an actual thing that my literary agent told me when meeting <laughs> so, with publishers. So, if you time. show up on time, they take you less seriously because they're no, like, it's, it's like a sign of desperation. Well, they, <laughs> <laughs> they, they take you like, oh, what other publisher are you meeting with? Oh, gotcha. You know, because you're the agents always set it up as like you're meeting with all these different publishers. And they're like, why was that meeting going long? It's like trying to get funding in the valley, yeah. going through different VCs or something like that. Yeah, are you in? Because this one's totally in, but they're offering. <laughs> I'm not telling you what they're offering. Yeah, it's, it's and funny. everything that I've ever learned is if you show up on time, you're late. But if you show up early, you're on time. Yeah. That's, well, that's I would, I did that whole military thing, and I'm like, you know what? Uh, screw that shit. I'm done waking up at 4 o'clock in the morning. So so we'll wait on Fred for future <laughs> podcasts from here but on out. But no, I, you know, I was, that was an important call. I you understand. Should, I understand. You I should know. set up a fake Fred replacement. <laughs> we, so well, like you have somebody like walking out the door when he walks in. Like, who was that? It's like, I don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's a great idea. It's just an interview. I wouldn't worry Just another that. podcast. We're interviewing. It's cool. <laughs> we, it's, it's our below the char guy. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> Well, he made the first joke there, so let's go to introduce him. So Brad Williams, he's the senior category manager for American Whiskey for Go Puff Brands, formerly that we've always known as kind of the big guy at spirits over at Liquor Barn. So Brad, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Excited to be here. Yeah. It's been a long time. I wasn't sure Fred was going to be here or not. I love seeing Fred. Last time I saw Fred, we were having fun. So Well, and now you are an official taster for the American Spirits Council of Tasters. Excited to I have you I am super there. excited. I do like to taste things. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, that, you grant, you're that a how rookie you get that judge. Qualification? He's a rookie judge, so he gets all the vodka. Do oh, I have to like uh, carry somebody's suitcase or? <laughs> Spit buckets. Spit go. buckets, so I get yeah. absinthe and vodka categories. You got to go get coffee and bagels in the morning. That's your thing. Go so it starts with vodka, then you get the cream liqueur and then absinthe, so... Well, oh, gosh. <laughs> listen, the cream liqueur industry would be elated because I am a sucker for all creams. So <laughs> they would be like, wow, cream everything was 90 and above. <laughs> wow. All right. Easiest rating. I don't judge ever. cream for that reason. I let somebody else say, I'm like, don't ask me because if it's got vanilla or cinnamon in it, it's a go. <laughs> um, so I let someone else. I will of... say the cream bourbons are really good. Yeah. Good. They're like, really yeah, good. I like bourbon creams. We talked about malt whiskey being the next big trend. I think that is... 
that's the trend of anything. If you have a brick and mortar as a distiller or anything like that, people just immediately go and gravitate. It's, like, let's, let's drink your, your bourbon cream. So we can, we can like, put it in our coffee and not feel bad about it. I know. know. <laughs> or, or their brownie and ice cream. There's right. all sorts of things you can do with it. But My like, wife puts makes a collagen cocktail out of it. Like whoa. So when she's like trying to like get her collagen in, she's like, yeah, I'm going to have a, a bourbon cream collagen cocktail. I'm like, cream. okay. Yeah, the, uh, the creams are what is working for the moonshine companies. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, banana pudding cream. Oh. Uh, you don't like you know, banana dark pudding? Dark chocolate oh. cream, no, I strawberry do. I just, cream. When, when, in reference to a moonshine with a banana, it's like, uh, you, know, you, you, you were to meet anything. with uh, Old Smoky or Sugarlands, top of the top would all be creams and the new cream they're yeah. working on. And it shows up in the numbers and <laughs> make money. Punch, American, punch, American all that stuff like is like shit. dropping. Yeah, that's, but, that's true. That's that true. In the South. Yep. Oh, I know. So before we kind of get kicked off here, we, we kind of talked a little bit before. So your your title, yeah. I mean, you cover a lot. I kind of want to recap a little bit of, of really what you're in charge of, because it's, a, it's quite a big portfolio and a lot of stores really kind of have to adhere to say, like, this is what, this is what Brad says about American whiskey. <laughs> Who have you been talking to? <laughs> uh, you know, you, somebody used to say like, oh, they wear a lot of hats. I always said, no, I have one hat, but it has a ton of teeny writing on it. Um, <laughs> it's uh, so, so traditionally, I've always worked for Liquor Barn for a long time. I've done a lot of things over the years. Uh, I've held almost every job outside of the finance team in one point or another from operations to I bought tobacco. I started as a beer buyer. I used to be a craft beer guy. I used to brew my own beer way back when, many, many moons ago. And then uh, eventually, you know, through multiple ownership changes, my role has changed and shifted and evolved into some different things. Currently, right now, I'm taking care of everything spirits for the state of Kentucky. So whether that's the Canvalanche of canned cocktails or Tito's or whiskey or barrels or tequila barrels or what we're going to sell or what we're going to sell it for, what we put in marketing for spirits, that's me. In the past, I managed a group of uh, what you might call merchandisers for the state where GoPuff purchased us maybe a year and a half ago. We reorged last April. And so we all kept what we're doing now. And there's sort of a future path what each of us will be doing. Uh, So now I'm doing everything for Kentucky. But in the future, my role will be mostly American whiskey, barrels, limited release items, uh, barrels, whether it's tequila, scotch, rum, bourbon, for where they are nationwide. GoPuff is maybe over 400 licenses. Oh, wow. Uh, most of it is beer. They're much bigger in beer than they are in spirits and wine. And when you say licenses, those are individual stores? Yeah. Okay. So they have uh, you know, they have things that are called MFCs, which are kind of uh, dark warehouse sites that you can't walk into. Then they have a brick and mortar or maybe what they call an Omni, which is where there's a little GoPuff inside of a store. So they have a lot of licenses. They have BevMo on the West Coast. They have Liquor Barn here in Kentucky. They have Manhattan Wine and Spirits in obviously Manhattan, spots in Boston, Florida, Colorado. And so there's a pretty sharp team uh, with a lot of backgrounds from BevMo, Liquor Barn, Sierra Nevada, Anheuser-Busch, Total Wine. Like we've got what we think is a, as a country now is a really strong group of merchandisers with a varied background of large chains, small chains, distributors, suppliers, breweries, covering everything. And then so we need an IT transition to get Kentucky dialed into GoPuff is why it seems GoPuff's been a little slower in Kentucky has been an IT issue. That is going to get solved this year. And then once that is solved, where everyone can see everything, then we will all sort of morph into our new roles. Uh, but I have been, uh, it's been a lot of fun, as you guys know. I have been picking barrels for the West Coast. I've been picking barrels for Florida along you've with been picking, Kentucky. You've been picking barrels for so long that it always makes me jealous. And we're friends on Facebook. And every single yeah. time you to- post a picture, I see it over at Buffalo Trace. And you're the only person that ever has 92 barrels rolled out for them for all the picks for the year. He picks more barrels than anybody oh, in the I, world. I would There's so. probably, well... Can we There's some others. That? No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, it depends on who you talk to. Some distilleries we've done the most. Others, it's uh, you know, it's the guys from Benny's. They do a lot. Yeah, uh, but you, uh, you know, you you do tequilas. You do rums, scotch. Scotch. I've done do scotch everything. in a while because I got burned in Kentucky out of excitement. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> we should do this. It's great. It tastes great. And it's like, oh, it's a sherry barrel, and it's. 300 cases. So if you're not the number one barrel picking person out there, let's say you're top three. 
Oh, I'll give you. I that. just say we do a lot. <laughs> and I'd like to think I'm in the top. So GoPuff, GoPuff is kind of created as like this kind of a cannabis store, right? Like it started in like having a little you know, cannabis connection. It's not, and that's at least what I'm told. Um, it started as I think it was kind of one of their graduate projects in Philly, where the two owners began delivering things out of their own car and their own van to mostly students. You know, their top, I mean, you know, their most, their times were like 11. I mean, without people. saying it, right? Yeah, right. There you go. I knew what, you're, was, I know what you were thinking. Uh, yeah, there, so right. it's like students are cramming for exams and they're bringing that in Red Bull. Too, right? <laughs> <laughs> Red sounds Bull. Like, sounds like there's a premise on half-baked at one point, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the first thing is, my dad's Funyuns like, you're working for a marijuana company? No. <laughs> I, I do I have don't to sell say, marijuana anywhere. If, if, you're, if you're just listening to this, I am wearing a shirt from my freshman year in college. This thing is uh, 20 something years old. Yeah, I'm afraid you're doing college. great. I couldn't put anything on for my freshman year of college right now. <laughs> Maybe my that, socks. That, it's a great idea because we had that. We would sit around till it's like 2 a.m. and I wish I had a. We would pay $25 delivery fee for anything. It's like, and we were like, oh, we'll do a $25 delivery. So it's a brilliant idea. So that was their idea. Was I think it was $1.50 and you get it within 30 minutes. Mm. Uh, and so they're, you know, they're delivering people diapers at six. You know, we've all got kids, right? And you're like that one time at 5:30 oh, yeah. in the morning, you got no wipes, so you're out of diapers. <laughs> Like, they'll get it to you in 30 minutes. Um, so then they expanded into alcohol, trying to get alcohol license, because that's the main thing people want delivered. And Liquor Barn was already, we were fortunate enough that before the pandemic, we were already in a sprint. Like, we were already sprinting for delivery. So when the pandemic hit, we were sort of, for at least a year, we were like the only delivery game. And then everybody caught up in 21. Yeah, but you all, you all outflanked Drizzly in this market. Yeah, I remember the you still have the the advertisements at SDF inside the airport. Oh yeah, Bourbon yeah. Taxi. Yeah, so bur- people people love that. So I think uh, you know there were all the Facebook posts where people would like do a chalk drawing and it says parking for liquor barn only, like out in front of their house, <laughs> uh, and send that around. So that helped. And then GoPuff for GoPuff to be successful, you can't guarantee thirty minutes unless you have a lot of spots. So mm-hmm. you have to have more spots. And from what I understand, I've never heard this, but people tell me it's true, is that a liquor barn is within 30 minutes of like over 80% of Kentuckians. Oh, yeah. No, I, no, I, I right. buy regularly from you all. Right. Um, so you could, true. you could say if you want to get to 80% of Kentucky, you could put a GoPuff component in every one of our stores, and that would then be true. Yeah. So they'll yeah. get there one day. You know, their their top items are like ice cream and beer and like ice cream and seltzer. <laughs> yeah. Their their average age is like eighteen to thirty or something like that. So like the refined scotch drinker is not a go puff customer right now. And that's where Bevmo and Liquor Barn come in, where they're trying to kind of diversify and get out to, you know, different age ranges. So Yeah, you kind of see it I've I've noticed over the past five years all this consolidation of just here locally, like of local stores becoming, you know, either liquor barn go puff stores or evergreen or, you know, this, yeah. that, and it, I kind of tied it back to when total wine moved in. It kind of seemed like that was like the catalyst, but maybe not. It just, that changed everything in this state from, we talked about this earlier, things being very gray areas to suddenly black and white. They entered the state had to be black and white. Otherwise there would be trouble in which, you know, some, Distributors or suppliers use that as a crutch on why they don't want to do something. Uh, but you know, one could say they clean things up. Everyone else would be like, no, they made everything hard. But it is what it is, right? Competition is competition. We always feel like it made us better. You know, the first year they were here, we took some punches. You learn from, we talked about this. We, <laughs> yeah. we learn from, you know, a bloody nose. We learn from skinned up knees or maybe even, you know, like, no, they knocked us out for about two seconds. We woke up and said, we won't fall for that again. So we view them as sort of helping us evolve come up with new plans, don't get lazy, be scrappy. Like no matter how big we are, we still talk about it. The owners of GoPuff was like, no matter what, be scrappy. So you try to, you know, look yourself in the mirror, like be scrappy today, Brad. (laughs) Start a fight with somebody. Pump yourself up, hit the punching bag before you go to work every morning. Yeah. That sort of thing. Anyway. So one of the things that, you know, with GoPuff, the first thing that came to my mind with the acquisition, I don't know whatever happened with it, but you all get the largest allocation of Pappy Van Winkle in the country. I told you that. Oh, I was kidding. Uh, it, this is it definitely is right where you go, huh? Be like, uh, this is, the people always want to know, where's yeah. the Pappy and Beach? Where, where, where's, I, yeah. mean, I, go? Mean, I just walk into a, a liquor barn. And Fred's say, a label chaser. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but do you, is that, is that something that you all are able to like spread that the allocation of like Kentucky out to the other four hundred stores? No, no, it has to stay in the state. 
the way a lot of that works with most people is they give the distributor an allocation for the state, mm -hmm. and then that distributor divides it out within the state. So let's say they said, oh, you get 100 cases of you know, Van Winkle 10. And then somebody says, well, we, you know, we'll take 70, and why don't you send 30 of them to Florida? Uh, the distributor would then throw a fit and say, no, those are our 100 cases. We're not moving anything anywhere. It also gives companies like Sazerac or Heaven Hill an out to say, hey, no, we gave the state what we think the state deserved, and then Distributor X divided it up right. equitably by the state's fair trade practices, which is a gray area as well, it seems like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It no, seems like single barrel allocations kind of work that way too, right? The distributor determines, you know, how many single barrels. So of it's, it's comedy for me sometimes because you talk <laughs> to enough people and like four people give you a very buttoned up answer. And then one person's like, yeah, whatever you want. <laughs> what are they going to say about this? Oh, they'll do it. And it's like, so I can get as many as I want from you. But, but over here, <laughs> you, I'm under these strict set of rules. So we attempt to do our best to play by all the rules and live by the processes that are put in place. Because you, you can hurt some feelings locally or with distributors or suppliers if you don't. So we, we try to be good boys and girls. Well, I mean, speaking of the single barrels, you're, you're doing so many of them. And the fact that you have the title and you're looking over all spirits at Kentucky and you're growing into the role of taking care of American whiskey and, and the GoPuff portfolio, I'm struggling to see how you have time to do all this because – I think we selected 50 barrels last year and I'm going, that was way too many. Yeah, we're I cutting it back. <laughs> yeah, we got to cut that back. So how are you able to devote and basically put your time in the right places? How are you doing time management that way? You know, it's it's kind of like uh, getting into a workflow of uh, knowing when you're doing it, what I have to be done by certain deadlines. So if that means instead of stopping at 5.30 or 6 on Monday and Tuesday and I go until 8 at my desk until 8, Monday and Tuesday I go until 8 so that... I can do have would have to do Wednesday morning in meetings and Wednesday afternoon I can go to Four Roses, knowing that no I didn't I had all this stuff done by Wednesday afternoon or like I'm not gonna have time to get this done on Thursday morning. Adding in some of the other brands barrels has has been a little. I've had to do jump through a few hoops and change some schedules and rearrange some meetings. Uh, a lot of what happens with them sometimes are samples instead of going. So I've been doing a lot, which this sort of came out of the pandemic. Everything I did in the pandemic was at home. So I actually sort of grew to love, I, I love all of you distilleries and barrel managers, mm -hmm. but I actually grew to sort of love doing them at home. I might come up at like 4 PM, turn on some music, get out a huge glass of water, pour all the samples out. And I call it getting intimate. You know, sometimes, <laughs> right? Like wow, what, chicken, what, wow, what music wow. you turned it some, on? Some candles. R&B. Caressing sample day. <laughs> Got R, R. Kelly on or something. I just felt like uh, when I'm doing it at home out of bottled samples, I'm a little more dialed in yeah. and a little more aware. And I can go back to the well and do it and not feel like I could drive anywhere or be anywhere or be at a meeting. Uh, you, at, you don't have the you don't have the people in your ear saying, and this hills the distilled on the rainy day right when the tornado came. Uh, <laughs> yes. That's right. You know, or people who, um, I mean, there's just the, people the who aren't used to it and they're yeah, asking the, questions. And, you know, sometimes, you, you know, I always say the perfect number for a barrel pick is three because three tasters, it's, it's three, yeah. it's one, it's uneven. And somebody to break the tie. Yeah, you get to like five and six people, it's like herding cats and people are on oh, the wrong yeah. samples and people put down sample D where sample B went. Right. Um, it gets harder. So, I've, you know, over the years, I've sort of developed a few, uh, I don't want to call them cheats. Uh, but then again, doing them at home, I'll do them on Friday night. I'll do them on Saturday afternoon, whatever. And that's been a little more fun. I'm assuming you've gotten to the point where if you do go in an on-site barrel pick, they're like, would you like a tour? You're like, I'm good. I'll see you later. That is correct. <laughs> Some of them know. They're like, thank God it's you. I'm so glad it's you. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to tell you anything. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, just show let's up. pour the samples. Mm -hmm. You know, but the, the greatest is when you just get to really, you know, kick back and, and enjoy yourself at a distillery or at an event like... When we were hanging out at Bourbon and Beyond, I mean that it was, was awesome. some, that was some of the best time I'd had in a long time. Because wh when do we ever really get to just sit down and enjoy ourselves? Everything's oh, you know. And, and granted, we all have the best job in the world, right? We right. get to do this for a living. But uh, there, there are times you're just kind of like it's work, and you want to have fun. But those times when that the, the layers are moved, you know, and it's not work, that's the best. And you can't do that at yeah. a distillery. No, exactly. Damn. Or you're under a time limit or they got somebody else coming in or you got to go somewhere else. So when it's casual, I think it's more fun, A. And I always think, you know, bourbon should be fun. 
whiskey should be fun. American spirits should be fun. It should not be a chore. Uh, I used to say, you know, if you if you if you wrote four paragraphs on this, you wrote too much. <laughs> like well, that, that's too much. Uh, yeah, for um, <laughs> not, just, hold on, hold on. No, no, I'm not telling you. I got to come to some uh, defense here. Oh, no, no, I'm not saying what is said is wrong. It's more like no, no. Let's just taste this, let's enjoy it. Let's put out what we think is best about it, and then let's move on to another barrel, or let's finish sample A because it was the best. You know, I enjoy the samples because I blend them. You get bored and. You start dumping the samples into a decanter, dump these into a decanter. I've crossed distilleries. Yeah. Sometimes that works. A lot of times it doesn't. I mean, speaking of doing that, when you take the different samples, with the leverage you all have, are you going back to them and saying, you know, I really liked A and B. If you could combine those together, can we get something? Rarely works. Yeah, is it? I've made more than a few promises to certain people of like, we'll do this for you if you let us come do a blend. Well, blend takes this many barrels. We get that many barrels. Well, if we do it for you, we have to do it for someone else. Well, I'll do it for them too. <laughs> well, no, we don't want to do it. Uh, there's a distiller who loves his summer ale. And I literally was like, I will buy you a case of summer beer a week during the summer <laughs> if you let us blend these. No way. No way. So other distilleries are letting people do blends. And um, I love blending. I think it's fun. It, it's hard. Like, I got a lot of respect for you guys doing blends. It's not the average consumer doesn't understand how hard it is to blend something to a place. Yeah. You just, so when I say I was blending, I'm just dumping samples in a decanter, <laughs> letting it get some air, adding a drop of water or something. And then, like, you know, the next <laughs> week, like, like, this one turned out awesome. Then you open <laughs> the other one's like, am I going to have to dump this one? This one's terrible. Like, I can't recreate um, this, right? though. I didn't write down my steps. <laughs> right. So, uh, you, you know, Blenders, I have a lot of respect for trying to, you know, the old saying, a rose is a rose is a rose. Like somebody to blend something to something all the time takes a real talent. And I think it's a lot of fun. More people are doing it now than before. Uh, we Even Liquor Barn has to be careful with blends because, you know, you can sell a barrel like this and like, oh, you can sell a six barrel blend. Well, that didn't really sell like that. Right. You sold the first three barrels like this and then it must have become saturated to those fans and the other three are just sort of kind of hanging around. So... Yeah, talk about that. I guess because you see, like, uh, you know, obviously the big six dis- brands are they move like crazy, but like, you, there's got to be brands that you're like, I really like this, you know, and I want to help expose it or whatever, but it just doesn't resonate with fans or consumers. Uh, it's, I have seen what I, in my mind, I look at it, I was like, that's a home run. It tastes great, packages great. These guys got a great story. And then it's like, next thing you know, like, nobody wants it. Except for like the people I forced to try it in the stores and they're all like, I, I love this. I don't understand why no one else loves this. And then you got, you know, something that's terrible at packaging, terrible story. The liquid's okay. You're like, we sell tons of this. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's got a, you know, it's got a horse. No, maybe, maybe something else, runs. right? Uh, yeah. A horse. You wouldn't believe what people think will sell because it has a horse on it. Um, oh, sometimes sure. it works. Sometimes it doesn't, but. It's yeah, a tequila there, with a horse on. It's like I don't think that's. Is what there like a, a horse with her. It's like it's a horse with a sombrero. Right. That's how it works. Is there like a time period? As uh, I guess you're looking at like how long it sits on a shelf that it's a, a success or b I'm going to move. You know, like good question. Yes. You know that I, you know I try to get out in the stores a lot. Everything's been so busy in the last year that I'm kind of a creature of habit. And the store staff at Springhurst and Party Mart probably like, oh god, here he is again. <laughs> um, <laughs> those are the two I frequent the most. And um, I see things there. And if I see something, I might take a note or put a note in my phone. I go back and open our system, which shows me everything and say, wait a minute, you know, I can't believe this barrel pick is still sitting on this shelf here. Then you look around like everyone sold out the two stores. Then I might say, hey, you know, take those six bottles, send them to Springhurst, they'll sell them out or take these from Hamburg, send them to Beaumont because they'll sell out. Uh, so there is some of that. And you know, it's, it's, um, I've always felt like doing business with local companies, local distillers, small guys was just good business. And so if, uh, you know, some people have always made, oh, they'll do a barrel of anything. Yeah, I might. <laughs> I might do a barrel of anything at least once. At least once, yeah. <laughs> Until I, mean, I did one barrel and then it's like, it didn't really sell, so I'm not going to do it again. Or yeah, I did so, do one barrel and or it is did that, Is that like three months, five months, six months, you know? I the, would say it's six months is six where months. I get concerned. Okay. Like, okay, we're going to have to mark this down to cost or like never do this rum barrel again. Is that a marketing issue? Is it just a consumer awareness? Because you had mentioned earlier, you said, I love it. This is great. That's a great story. But how do I portray this to my customers? Because unless somebody's out there hand selling it or talking about it, it's going to sit there. It's, you know, everybody has a short attention span. So I can do uh, Instagram live with somebody, talk about it. We can put it in an email, blast to 100,000 people. Uh, I can get stores fired up about it. They're going to get fired up about something else within two weeks yeah, or something new. And then so it just sort of, I used to say, and it's still sort of true, 
the best scotch at liquor barn for the holidays is the last ambassador that visited the store. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's like whoever's last is who is going to, is the scotch that's going to win Christmas. That's why I pop in and talk to Steve Hamrick as much as possible. At Party Mart. <laughs> yeah. He's like been a savior to us so brad i i look at what you do and you talked about like the small brands and you will do a barrel pick with anybody i get so many pr pitches yeah. and everything but the small brands don't have pr companies and so i look to you and what you put in the store as my way of discovering brands that don't actually Deep have pockets. any kind of marketing plan right, right? And, you know, all the the beams, the four roses, I mean, they, they have PR companies and even like the... Uh, but for the most it, part, they don't the, even really need PR companies no, they for don't. all this stuff. And the mid-tier, the mid-tier brands like, uh, you know, we mentioned Westland, yeah. you know, someone like that, they're going to have PR companies. But I found several brands in your, in your place. Uh, one was uh, Dueling Grounds, which I've been there. I knew about them, had their stuff before at like uh, events. But, you know, I didn't, you know, I'm not on their sample train, sample list. They don't send samples. So I bought a bottle of their stuff. Driftless Glen, another one uh, that does not have any kind of outreach to media whatsoever. But I buy those bottles there and they were part of my discovery. So I look at you and you're the only retailer who does this. You're the only one who takes a flyer on these small brands that no one's looking at. So... I mean, I, I think that I love a, you, Fred. That's a huge, <laughs> huge, uh, huge compliment to what I, you I, do. And I, I, you know, I'm not just saying that. I've always believed, like, um, whether we were owned locally or owned from Canada or owned by GoPuff, is like you can still be local. You can still support local businesses, local employees, uh, hyper local, whatever you want to be. It's just good business. And what I learned from doing this for too long is that way back, let's call it 2010, 2012, I took flyers on things. Um, and some of those things worked out. And to this day, those people are very loyal to us and to me. And if I call certain people and say, hey, man, I need some help with this, they do it. Mm -hmm. And that's what paid off from investing at least in a relationship 10 years ago when nobody would take that brand or nobody would take in these bourbon barrel cutting boards or coat racks or or things of that nature. People, you know, they remember that. So I've always, you know, if I forget what I'm doing or uh, often sometimes, and you, this happens to you guys, we talked about already, is like you you take for granted what we're doing every day mm -hmm. and what we have access to. And for example, to see a person who has never touched a bourbon barrel full of bourbon, open it, thief bourbon out, put it in a glass and take a sip, they it, that is very magical for them. So sometimes I have to watch that and be like, oh, I'm going to sit here and I don't want to thief any of this. <laughs> you know, and Give then the they're samples. like, but, but when you see the these people, you're like, you know what? I forgot. I forgot how yeah, awesome yeah. that feeling is that we take for granted. Uh, a friend of mine has a bunch of buddies coming in for a birthday in a couple of weeks, and they're going to all these distilleries, and I helped them set up some visits, and they sent me their itinerary that they were doing this. And I literally was like, man, these guys are so hyped about these things. I literally take all of this for granted. I would have, you know, For that, I would have been like, I don't have time for that. we got to go here and do this. And these guys are super hyped about this. So again, it's kind of a reset or, you know, time in the mirror of like, be thankful for what we have, try to develop relationships and help people because they might have to help me one day. So that's part of my, you know, credo for trying to get those people on the board. But you're, you're like, um, you're a great discovery point for American whiskey. And yeah, I mean, you go in the stores, like you go in the Middletown store and you go back there in the, like the, the trophy room you got all your bro dudes walking back there in their fresh khaki pants and their golf shirts, you know, puffing up, looking at the bottles. The phone's open. This is yeah. what I've noticed, too. The phone is open and the camera's on, like, while they're walking around. Yeah. <laughs> I was at Springhurst yesterday for an hour in the middle of the day, and I was surprised how many people were at the Springhurst store. We were back in that little glass room around noon, walking around, peering in the room, peering in the case, phone's open. <laughs> And it was like, just, God, they, just are they are they researching or oh, just yeah. trying to show off or what? They're James Bond, all of it. Yeah, you know that's another thing. That's the best joke about like the Sazerac change. All these guys that follow the trucks and know know what day they delivered to Springhurst and what day Sazerac delivered to Hamburg. They're have to start over. <laughs> <laughs> Truck stalking. They're two point oh. They're the most disappointed of anyone. In this whole deal, <laughs> right? So the other question is like the mantra of what liquor barn is to try to beat up to bourbon as well because you go to there you go to party mart you go to a lot of these places everything has changed in the past few years where you have designed the store to be 
front and center bourbon. So when you come in, you walk in, you notice it. Like that is where you notice. And the aisle is just massive. And is it to try to be that place where you want people to come that are visitors, tourists, locals, whomever it is, to say, we are going to have the largest bourbon selection of anybody across the state? Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. Shopify's point of sale is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. And with Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers in line and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. And get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point of sale system, or use Shopify's point of sale Go Mobile device for a battle tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award winning 24 7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash bourbon, all lowercase, and go to shopify.com slash bourbon to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash bourbon. If you're anything like me, then you can't get enough about bourbon. And that's why I'm a subscriber to Bourbon Plus magazine. Bourbon Plus is a quarterly publication that tells the stories from the heart of bourbon, the farmers who grow the grain, the distillers who labor over the process, and the people like you and me who raise their glasses to celebrate it all. Subscribe to Bourbon Plus Magazine today at bourbonplus.com, that's P-L-U-S dot com, and use code PURSUIT at checkout for $5 off your subscription. Everything has changed in the past few years where you have designed the store to be front and center bourbon so when you come in you walk in you notice it. like that is where you notice and the aisle is just massive and is it to try to be that place where you want people to come that are visitors tourists locals whomever it is to say we are going to have the largest bourbon selection of anybody across the state i try to we try to of course from what people call category management perspective occasionally you bring something in, it doesn't work, and you're like, man, we can't rebuy bourbon XYZ because it just didn't sell. It took us two years to sell six bottles. You know, you're financially upside down by that point. You got somebody in finance or accounting, like, what's going on here? So you might drop something just based on sales, right? Well, then you're like, hey, the other behemoth in town never drops anything. So you're like, yeah, that one might still be available over there. We had it for two years. We just couldn't justify uh, I've rebooted things before occasionally like, oh, they're bigger. You know, we tried them for three years, didn't have them for a couple of years. Now they're bigger. Things are different. Let's give them another run. So there was a time we wanted to be everything to all people uh, in bourbon or even spirits or alcohol, like whether you want cheap vodka or overpriced vodka, whichever one you want, we got it for you. Is we started doing some management going, it's just not financially healthy to carry all these things and we'll let someone else have that. And then we kind of came to Jonathan Blue and I actually came to a... Uh, kind of agreement that, no, we need to try to be everything to bourbon. Again, whether that's candles or bourbon barrel aged wine or beers or racks or, or coat racks or spheres, you try to do that with that. So you think of us first. Who do you think of first, to Fred's point, who do you think of first for a, a craft bourbon from New Mexico? We want it to be us. And you would hope there's a lot of places. We talked about a place earlier today, is that when someone's out of town, and they come, they're staying at the Omni or they're staying downtown somewhere. They're like, where do I need to go? Well, you need to go to this place. You need to go to this place. Yeah, and run by these two liquor barns. Who knows what you'll find? Check their barrel pick-in cap. Check their case. Talk to the manager. You know, that's sort of the goal is to be on. And I'm not saying the only list, like just to be on the list of places that need to be Explore, visited. discover. Yes. Yeah, yeah, whatever it is. Right. And the other thing is we also talked a bit earlier about the changing dynamic of the consumer too. What have you seen of, of trends that are going to start happening in this year and going forward, because the things that we have seen is that at least in our community, people are pulling back on a lot of massive purchases, just going in and just buying, 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 buying. So what do you kind of see is, is the future of, of just where the, the consumer is heading? 
I guess in the bourbon world. Let's let's hope they're not all jumping to tequila yet. They're not jumping to tequila. I'll shock some people. A lot of people know this. Our close friends know this. I'd say I drink probably 40% aged tequila. Like when we hung out, Fred, I, I hit yeah. your tears of Lorena twice. Yeah. <laughs> so good. I know. So good. The bottle, the bottle told me. Uh, oh, you know, ooh, it's, uh, man. You know, I guess I hadn't been touched in years. So, <laughs> uh, and I went to tequila backwards. Is that when uh, the Canadian company owned us, they'd met with Brown Foreman's 2012. And they said, they want to do a barrel of Herradura and you're going to do it. And I whined like a top. I don't want to go to Mexico to taste tequila. I hate, you know, my mind, it was college. It was like Cuervo, Montezuma, Montezuma <laughs> yeah. worms, yeah. just all the... Terrible the crap. worms, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I went down there, did a barrel, a uh, double barrel of Reposado, tried the Añejo and fell in love with it and have just been slowly loving that ever since. I think, Fred, you did a book on rum and I think I think I texted you, he's like, why are you going to do a book on tequila? Because I was already yeah. fully nerded out. Yeah. Uh, to this day, I am and I've, I've become full, um, I might even be a tequila asshole. Oh gosh. I may have reached that status. Yeah. Tequila um, geek. So I think, I think, Bourbon opened the door for other things aged in a bourbon barrel or barrel aged and whether people had, I just think for a long time, people had no idea that Europe was using used bourbon barrels or that rum was used bourbon barrels or that Tabasco was in a bourbon barrel or mm-hmm. that's how you you age colored tequila or aged tequila. Some people say it's colored and some of them are. But uh, I, th- I think bourbon has put a kind of umbrella over anything in a barrel. Um, we right. used to joke like you put cat litter in a barrel, we could probably sell a bag of it. <laughs> that's that's I'm um, I'm, right? I'm a sucker for it's it. Too. You put barrel aged litter. anything, barrel aged chocolate, barrel aged whatever. So, I'm probably gonna buy it. I, hold on, I I want to go to the psyche of why cat litter. Why did you come up? <laughs> why did you say cat litter? Because there's because I usually try to come up with the most preposterous thing ever. <laughs> that's pretty I preposterous. Used to say, I mean, we got a business plan now. <laughs> but, right, yeah. listen, I used to say peanut butter bourbon. That'd be good. Well, that actually. sounds really yeah, good. Sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, kind of a it sounds like now. something that happened. Yeah. I love peanut butter. Like, so then I changed that to menthol absinthe or peanut butter absinthe. No, uh, no thanks. Okay. <laughs> Within the next five years, there's probably a peanut butter absinthe. Uh, so usually something like that, you just make it as preposterous uh, or unne- the barrel was completely unnecessary for cat litter. You've heard it here first. Cat litter bourbon <laughs> is the next trend in America. Mittens <laughs> loves it. Uh, anyway. So I, and I think so. That is where bourbon hit it. I think there will always be. I mean, Hardee's has a bourbon burger. I think they were co-branded with Jim Beam at one time. Yeah, Har- good. Hardee's had the the smoked bourbon. Yeah, right? they, they so came out. Arby's had one too. Yeah. Yeah, so Hardee's it, had Arby's. Had right. One. Maybe it was Arby's. Sorry, it was Arby's. Yeah. So I knew it was one of the roast beef places. But um, I think that's that way. And I think you know, short term things are just like they are. I do think the future is blends, uh, unique barrel. Like everybody's talking about Amberana. Oh, gotta get yeah, that Amberana. Yeah. Gotta get that cigar finish. Yeah. Where was that two years ago? You know, who had an Amberana finish? Kishasa. That's about it. So I think that is a direction where people can get single barrels. Will always be single barrels. They will always hold a dear spot for everyone. But I think weird finishes, weird blends. I'm still waiting on collaborations to take hold, like beers do, uh, where you get two uh, distillers collaborating a lot, not here and there. But mm-hmm. the the alcohol machine probably keeps that suppressed more than beer yeah when, when you when you say of the the finishes are you thinking that it's just gonna get wider and crazier or do you think it's gonna start diminishing a little bit and people don't, people don't care about the sherry finish or the port or the whatever they there are like i think they used to be scared of it and now they're not now it's intriguing and maybe it'll flame out but you know uh I had somebody gave me a sample of their white port finished rye. Two samples. One of them I didn't care for at all. One of them I literally called him. Was like, I need this. And he was like, Sorry, there's. <laughs> he was delicious. Why, why would you give me? So who would be like you know white want. port finish rye? It was like, No, it was great. So I, th- I think that's going to happen. I think blends will happen more. They have to, right? You know, I mean, it's a it's it's a matter of stretching a liquid. And I think the danger with all of this is is when you have somebody who comes from the building the brand side and they're in this room and they're all in their hoity-toity state thinking like what can we do that's different that's never been done before we're the first you know, to do so well, yeah well, that's that's the danger of barrel finish of blends and all this like mesquite <laughs> yeah <laughs> well i mean a lot, that, lot of charcoal filtering out there yeah. there's there's a lot of uh, mesquite you know i was played around with 20 years ago you know so I, I just feel like so many of these companies don't want to listen to consumers. You know, if someone comes out with a toasted product, I know they're listening to consumers because they love them. They want <laughs> toasted. Yeah. You know, a but, tidal wave. 
But if they come out with a white Zinfandel finish, ain't nobody wanting that. It's true. It's it's a it's a take it. Not. Well, well, like, it's, it's a certain say, customer because yeah, Sagamore Spirits came out with like a tequila finish, and I thought it was probably their best finished product ever. But yes. you know, Brian Tracy then said we can sell it worth a damn because people are like, "What is this? Is it yeah. shots of tequila?" And Brian, I was upset. Or, they came, know. they tasted me like, and we brought this. I was like, "Oh my gosh!" I think how much of this can we have? They're like, "There's one case. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah. That's it." Uh, so no, I you know I think it's. There's a lot of that going on. There's going to be some duds, and then there'll be home like toasted. I mean, look, if we went back, who was the original toasted? Mictors. It's now we, we talk about uh, that. double with oak, the brandy. But yeah. Yes, yeah, with double but oak to oak call it toasted, yeah, Mictors right. had to be. I think. 20, uh, 2014. 2014. Was that, I don't remember yeah. the first Mictors toasted. A, uh, a, a sample of a double oaked Irish whiskey a couple of weeks ago. No way. That's so they they had a sherry finish, a PX finish, uh, a Jimenez finish, and then it was like in double oak. And in my mind, I was like, well, there we go. This has now crossed the pond <laughs> into other, other well, whiskey I've Jameson branches. has it now, too, don't they? Like a double oak this, Jameson? They might. This yeah. was a, a smaller company owned by Gallo. It, the only thing that would work here is double oak. The other three, like you know, Jameson, Tullamore, pretty much own Kentucky Irish whiskey. Uh, you can get away with some tea leans or some Waterfords or some other like really. You find that guy that's just willing to spend a hundred bucks on yeah. an Irish whiskey here. I like red breast. That's good. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. A friend of mine, you know who you are. <laughs> um, he talked me and we pulled out a red breast fifteen cask oh, maybe man. a month ago, and it was nice. We had a fire outside, and we oh, were literally like, like or no, just the regular oh, bottle, okay. and we were just like, why do we not drink this more? Yeah, this is delicious. Uh, well, because um, you only got one liver, Brad. You know, <laughs> make it for now, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> for now. So the other the other thing I want to look at with consumer trends is we we get stuck in a bubble around here in Kentucky because we're bourbon, 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 and we start seeing something a trench on our turf of tequila or something else. But you have to kind of break outside that bubble because you have to be outside of Kentucky. You've got to take care and think of your, your Bebmo customers, your Manhattan customers. So how do you start looking at the trends of the broader population and figuring out what do we need to put more emphasis on for customers well, that are outside of Kentucky? And you got to think of people coming to Kentucky too that don't live here, you know, and they're coming to travel here. And how do we appeal to well, them. They, they're coming to know. Kentucky for bourbon. Well, that's, I know, I know, thing. but you can't just pivot, you know, for Kentucky consumers to appeal to. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. I'm just saying that if you have a consumer in California that isn't traveling to Kentucky, that isn't sure, the right. one doing that, you've got to make sure that you are paying attention to the trends that are happening in that particular sure, region sure. and focus on I get that. It, yep. So that's, that was my so alignment. Whatever. There was a time when I covered the great state of Alaska and I was oh, doing, yeah. I was I doing that. barrel picks for them. Can you can you just roll back? Just give me the story. What do you mean you covered the great state of Alaska doing barrel picks for them? Uh, we were owned by a Canadian company called Liquor Stores North America, and they owned a chain in Alaska called Brown Jug. And I was their spirits buyer for about four years. So that came with doing barrels for them as well. And so I put in a, a Hancock barrel and I put in a Buffalo Trace barrel and they were like, oh, it's like, oh my gosh. It's so spicy. It's so strong. So spicy. So then, even though it was their spirit spire, so I look at all their numbers, no matter what it is, and they like plastic bottles of Canadian whiskey, plastic bottles of vodka. That's the top up there. Uh, I'm I'm sure there are people in Alaska that listen to you. I'm not not denigrating you guys. I love that place. Brown Jug is awesome. My man Bruce up there still does picks. Good dude. So I changed it around, and when I was doing their picks, I always made sure there was – some sort of noticeable sweetness. And I don't mean like candy sweetness, but if it's if it's just a little more caramel or a little more vanilla, just enough that it wasn't some spice bomb. And just that one tweak, they're like, oh man, this Four Roses is great. He's like, yeah, because I did the one that was kind of cinnamony sweet uh, for you guys. <laughs> and that worked. California, I know there are hardcore whiskey drinkers in San Francisco, which is a huge hub for BevMo, LA, all these places. So I'll go ahead and tell you that uh, I did some Sazerac picks in the fall and they were for BevMo and Liquor Barn and BevMo got what we rated as number one. Uh, They got what our number one Weller was and what our number one Buffalo Trace was because like, no, I'm going in strong. I'm going in. Somebody else will tell me to tone it back Um, (laughs) or that's not going to work. Right. I did have a, you know, and my approach always changes. I'm not going to say it's schizophrenic. I had a little dude, about two years ago, who is around the community and stuff. And he was like, man, 
your pics are always so spicy and bold. And I was just like, is that bad? Is that... Wait, did he talk like that? Was he a bro, dude? Spicoli? Yeah. 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 Oh, man. What's up, bro? Sort of. Sort yeah. of. He, he uses the word slaps a lot. So. <laughs> well, I, I'm aged out of slaps. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, what well, did, how does he dress? Is he, is he in a, like... Uh, is he in a well, we're not going to profile him now. Let's, let's, let's I, I want to. I want to paint a picture here for the audience. He's <laughs> oh, he's standard late twenties. <laughs> okay, all right. But it got up in my headspace. All right. That I was like, am I picking things like too spicy or too strong or not balanced enough? Or to me, there's two balances. There's balance boring and there's balance awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, everything is a seven out of ten. Okay, awesome. <laughs> everything is a four out of ten. No. Uh, that's balance boring. So then I went into this like, oh, I need to be more balanced. So then I thought, wait a minute, why am I walking away from what I think I know works and it has been successful in Kentucky and get messages on what they love? And so now if I'm doing two, I will always take the one that I think is best or that I love best and say, no, we're doing three barrels today. This one is happening 100% because I freaking love it. And then the next two, I'll try to take a more uh, communal approach of like, this one might be a little more balanced or, you know, this was my number one and that one was my number two, but the other two people, that was their number one and mine was their number two. So I'm taking this one first and then I'm going to listen to them and say, you know what? This was their favorite and I also liked it. It wasn't my favorite, but I also liked it. So that makes sense that three different people think these are the two best barrels. Yeah. That's got to be tough because yeah, you, you want to, you want to make sure they sell to the customers, but you want to what you think's best. And, too. It's uh, like you guys probably know this by now, Fred, for sure. You too is sometimes what you taste that day does not translate. You get the bottle. You're like, man, this is the best four roses I've picked in a long time. You get it home, you pop it and you drink it. And you're like, ah, man, it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> they put the right so, on here. <laughs> you know, I learned, um, a long time ago, you, you put on the horse blinders, like so-and-so didn't like it. Fine. Fine. You know, I don't like Pepsi. My wife loves Pepsi, you know, so it's just like, whatever. You didn't like that pick. Uh, we had a guy in 21, we did a stag junior pick or stag, sorry, stag pick. And I had people texting me, I need a bottle. I need a brother bottle. I'll pay you whatever. I need a, all of people looking for it, loving it. I loved it. Just need a drop of water. It was awesome. And some little guy in Lexington lit me on fire. Of uh, it was terrible and it was too strong. It was all alcohol. And I thought Liquor Barn did good barrels and this barrel sucks. And <laughs> people were like, Yeah, whatever. I loved it. And that's the perfect example. It's like, Fine. You think it sucks. I didn't hit a home run for you. That's okay. Um, that's how pallets work. And I'm not always going to hit a home run for everybody. You've got to have thick skin in this kind of game. Well, if you're in all the bourbon groups online, you, you read your name <laughs> or you read your store or something you did specifically. Yeah. And then I try not to comment unless I know something's like unequivocally like not true. Like that is not true. That's not who makes that or that's not that that's not a real law. So and well, otherwise I try to stay out of it like F you, you don't know anything. Maybe he does. Maybe there's a whole group of hymns that think it sucks and I only talk to the fifteen guys that think it's great. Yeah. So gotta have thick skin. Yeah, I would think so. Just because you're in you're in a position that this was unicorns were really barrel picks for quite a while, and that's what people would go after. That's what even we, gosh, proclaimed for the longest time. We said this is what you all need to go chase after. <laughs> yeah, Thank instead you. of the LTOs. And, and now it's kind of flipped around, and now it's like okay, now everybody's got a got a barrel pick somewhere. But it's one of those things that yes, it's it's your name on the label. It's your your reputation at stake, and so yeah, you have some sort of skin in the game to make sure that. You feel that you're picking the best thing, but it's impossible. It's impossible to sit there and appease to the 100% in the right. masses. Uh, there was a guy who, he made a post a couple of weeks ago, and it was about unicorns and barrel picks and barrel picks to the unicorns, and it took everything I had not to be like, I remember 2017. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, don't be a dick. And these guys are, in, and that's another thing. There are still people just barreling into, I didn't say that on purpose, into the bourbon game. Look at my collection. You're, you you posted it, what, three months ago? It was like a memory of your first collection. It was like 10 bottles or something <laughs> that, like that. that. Those pictures are still happening. So there are still people that are like, I got Basil Hayden, I got Knob Creek, I got Angel's Envy, and it's like... Found my first green label. Uh, you know, right? Yep. It's like, yeah, don't take a dump on those guys. Because eventually they'll be like, here's my collection, it's 214 bottles. So you have to kind of dial back and understand that there are guys don't know the difference between high rye bourbon and weeded bourbon 
or that yeah. Blanton's is allocated. I'm, I've seen that before. Fuck liquor bar. They didn't have any Blanton's. Like, I don't think this guy understands. Nobody has any Blanton's today. Um, so, so anyway. Brad's obviously referencing the uh, the culture of the Uber geeks and the Facebook groups and social Correct. social media. But I mean, I do, I do a lot of events all over the country and there's, I would say 5% are in those groups. And there's there's just so many new people coming into bourbon every single day, and it's it's kind of like you're saying, like that is that where that the noise comes from? You think? Yeah, the social media groups. And look, hey, we've all been taking our punches in there. I think it's good, and it's kind of keeps us all kind of a it keeps the whole industry in check. And you know, the uneducated get educated eventually, and then when somebody has a few things that they know, they eventually. Uh, become uh, become bored with the with the segment, and then go to something else, and then they come back. It's it's a culture that just it's it's just always kind of going around cycling like, circle. Of and, life. and there's but there's uh, my my point is there's so many people that aren't in that group but are huge enthusiasts, and they rely on you and Kenny and Ryan and you, and they come into the store, and it's like that's their moment, you know. And and like they don't get in the Facebook groups, and I, and if they do, they leave because they're like, yeah, these people are assholes, you know. It's so. uh, I used to joke, it, it, it's people I say, or even people we dealt with in our company is like, yeah, you know, there's a ton of bourbon assholes out there in the world, and like eighty two percent of them live in Louisville. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now let's let's all st- now hey, city of Louisville. Because... I love you. I've lived here twenty years. Yeah. That, that's not true. It's, it's like... only seventy two percent. Fair, I'm just kidding. Like I said, I've turned into a tequila asshole. One because I don't people don't think me of me that way, and I found myself in some meetings, you know, like you know, 1942. Let's get me some pancake syrup while you're at it. <laughs> Classe Azul, that is syrup. Uh, you need this, this, and this. And it was hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm over here cool. pontificating on additive free estate grown agave tequila because you're. You're doing the Lord's work there. I feel like it. I know. I feel like it's an education <laughs> with the tequila. I went through the same because I'm just stepping in, and I feel like I'm a noob there. I got the cause as well. I was like, "This is the greatest thing ever," and they're like, "There's so much sugar and vanilla oh. added." And I was like, "Oh, I don't like it then." I guess. <laughs> oh well, I will say I do prescribe to this, and it was with an old mentor, one of our old VPs, a long time ago. He called it the Yum Yuck Principle. <laughs> And he was like, take away every note, take away the label, everything. He goes, and in your own mind, for you personally, it's either yum or it's yuck. And if it's yuck, don't care about anyone else who says it's yum. And if it's yum, don't care about anyone else who says it's yuck because that's you. Your palate is your palate. It's your you're almost like your uh, tasting fingerprints. And it's okay to like something people hate. Yeah. And it's okay to hate something people love. Uh, so you try to tell your, and every now and then you taste something really bad. Uh, and then you're like, <laughs> lots, I hope yeah. you do. Resets of, everything. I hope your distillery yeah. on the beach does well. A lot of people, are like, I've never tasted a bad bourbon. I was like, uh, yeah, they're out there. There's plenty of them. <laughs> we get them sent to us. Well, I've only had one recently that I questioned and that I dumped. Usually I give it away or something and I dumped it. It's like, nobody deserves this. Well, then how about uh, you start being my initial taster on the, uh, on everything and like, uh, uh, I get probably I will, he 30 needs more things to do. I will <laughs> yeah. 30, 30 international international liquor bar and pop, pop, uh, puff. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, we're also Preds pre drinker as we want to get down to. Uh, and if it's if someone's trying to poison Fred, it would kill me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what, yeah, so. It has all those random boxes that show up with just uh, un, uh, unknown labels. It has happened. Remember, you remember early like two thousand seven, two thousand eight, when the moonshine craze was going on. I got I got sent the bottle. Um, that had yet to be registered and the TTB and all that. I, it was legit moonshine. And the guy's like, yeah, I'm going to start a company. I've been doing this for a long time. I, I drank it and I got dizzy. I lost. I was about, I felt like I was about to lose my eyesight. And I was like, I'm done drinking this shit. Yeah. But I kept the, I kept the jug. I'll so show you're the jug hired later. for that now, Brad. Yeah, by so the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I get samples for every whiskey under the sun, tequila under the sun, vodka, canned cocktails, you know, the canned cocktails and vodkas and things I don't really try because you almost don't need to. I will open every whiskey that gets sent to me and I will open every tequila that gets sent to me and at least get an idea. And then I either keep it. I used to call it, we used to do a game called Keep or Drain Pour because I'd have, you know, 50 samples. And then you're like, right. I just can't keep, where are we going to put all this? So it was either, I'd have people over and we'd be like, keep or drain pour. Then I thought, well, well, that kind of drain pour is kind of mean. You know, I know people that would 
drink this with Coke or ginger ale and just move on with their life. So now it's called keep give away or drain pour. Uh, there's only been a couple of drain pours recently, uh, but I, you know, Oh, did you have that? Yeah. In fact, I may have given it two or three drinks before I decided (laughs) like, there's no way in hell this will sell in Kentucky. It might sell in Florida because it was distilled there and the company's there and there's a localness to it. So even, you know, that's something I've tried to do working hand in hand. The BevMo team is awesome. Kim Sujimoto out there does an awesome job. And so for me, it's more like this sells in Kentucky. This doesn't sell in Kentucky. And you have to realize there's a whole different set of people out there. And so it might work there, won't work here. Do you want to do a private label bourbon from Minnesota? No. That might work in California. It worked in Alaska and it worked in Connecticut and it worked in Canada. Never worked here. We already tried it because the consumer here is the one thing in Kentucky that like we're way ahead. The average consumer here is way ahead of the average consumer in many no, downtown Chicago, San Francisco, New York. Yeah, there's a lot of guys that know a lot of stuff, but they're going to turn the label around. They're going to want to know where this place is from. If it doesn't say Kentucky on it, it better say Indiana or Tennessee. Yeah, I was about to say, as we as we start wrapping up here, I was kind of one of the last questions I was thinking of is, is as you get a lot of these samples in, what's your criteria to say, this is going to be good for Kentucky, this is going to be good for California, this will be good for Florida? Is there something, is there a magic formula inside your head or is it just, as it comes, you're just essentially a router? It's like yeah. the Zach Galifianakis from The Hangover with all the <laughs> yeah, the equations going around. Going around. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, not necessarily. I mean, we we were out there. We got pitched a new item. It was Blade and Bow. And I was kind of like looking around the room. I was like, are we on camera? What do you mean? <laughs> and I was like, of course, carry. Of course, you're going to carry Blade and Bow. What's happening here? Then there's other times where you just don't think it'll work. And I think the best thing about, I think, Kentucky bourbon drinkers have become much more open-minded over the last, pre- call it, when the MGP craze started with Boone County. When everybody was dropping those like 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 year old single barrels, suddenly before anybody knew it was from MGP, they thought it was great. And then they discovered it was MGP and everybody's attitude began to change. Same with Tennessee. So usually, you know, I call it the whiskey belt. It's basically Indiana, Kentucky, Tennessee, Uh, Virginia, New York, and, and Texas, I guess Colorado are trying to get into the club. And I think they probably deserve to be in there. But uh, if it's from Kentucky, Tennessee, or Indiana, I will always give it a shot. I know that's probably going to work in Kentucky. I'm going to take a chance on something like Reservoir from Virginia or Southern Stars from North Carolina. I actually really enjoyed their weeded bottle and bunt. They gave me five samples. We picked up two of them because I thought it was worth going out on a limb and taking something from North Carolina that was bonded, a weeded bonded bourbon, and just see what happens, you know. I thought it was good enough. I didn't, it's not like I'm going to take it to the, the deserted island game. No, that's not what I'm taking. But for all I know, somebody else will love it. And if that works, then more power to them. Mm. So you get things. You know, there's one. I don't know if you guys, is it uh, Fiddler's Green? Fiddler's Spirits out of Atlanta? They sent us some stuff. I was shocked. Now, it's sourced, but they've done some finishes to it. We did. I did some single barrels for California. We weren't sure if it would work. In Kentucky. Really good guys. I think they go by ASW. Oh, I know. I'm starting to see this stuff is starting to pop up on some secondary pages in clubs. I'm like, oh, there it is. It's one I kept that did not get dumped or given away. So I think Kentuckians are opening their mind. And maybe it's a younger generation coming in with more of an open mind or a worldly view um, based on the internet and other things. But you just got to take a chance on it and Yeah, there's things that are going to work in California that aren't going to work here. Uh, There's things that worked in Alaska that would not work here and vice versa. Yeah, the salmon whiskey being one. (laughs) We had the salmon vodka. Oh, this is a thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's salmon vodka. I thought it was a joke. It's amazing in a Bloody Mary. That's about it. And we brought it in. We put in a case in every store. And this is, you know, kind of retail talk. We put a case in maybe 10 stores. Uh, The first case sold quick because they had a little Bloody Mary recipe on the front of it. You place it with a case and then that never sold again ever. (laughs) It's like you'd covered all the salmon vodka drinkers in one swoop (laughs) and then they were done. Like they're finished. Like you're done. Mm. I love it. Brad, I want to say thank you so much for coming on the show today because you gave us a great insight into what you do and what you're doing to help broaden the the consumer's eyes of all everything that's out there as well. I think you're doing an important role in justifying everything of making sure that just people have choice. They have options. They are getting exposed to a lot of different things because I know that as we've been doing this show for a while, you definitely have those people out there that it's 
you know, Knob Creek or death. Right. Yep. And, yeah. and we, there's, there's so much more out there. And I think that you're doing a, a really good service in making sure that you're picking different barrels, you're trying things, you're bringing stuff in the store that really broadens the horizons of a lot of people out there. So thank you again for coming on the show and sharing more of your story yeah. and what you're doing for the company. Thanks too. for having me. I love it. I yeah, appreciate all that. Very cool. Because the small brands and media, you know, they need people like you to help them get started. You know, they start somewhere and it's hard to compete, you know, against, it's easy to sell the big six distillers here. And so it's pretty cool that you give, smaller brands even outside of kentucky a chance that's that's very and cool. the thing is he's not looking at case sales with them yeah he he does it and and i don't think he's doing it as philanthropy either i think he's doing it because he's trying to well no that's expand. deserving yeah. yeah he's expanding deserving but he's trying to expand the consumer's palate which is not easy in kentucky no and and look i mean you could say oh we're about price or we're about service it's like what do you really win by that so I think even at Liquor Barn, we've always been like, are we always the extra cheapest? No, but we think we have a very fair price. We're the cheapest on some things, but we think we have a fair price. We think we have really good customer service in our stores. We think we have a great selection. We think we give little guys help, right? Uh, we have bars. We have t- So we feel like these are all little components that all come together as the puzzle uh, of why, it, you know, uh, I won't be bashful. We think Liquor Barn is good. And there's certainly people out there that aren't fans. And I understand it. But, uh, oh, they do all these barrels. I'm not going to say we're the best. I'm not going to say we do the most. I'm just going to say that we do a lot and we try hard to put out a good barrel. And no, people don't understand this. You're subject to what is rolled out, yes. right? You Whatever, rolled whatever's out, there on that day. Right. You could roll 10 Buffalo Trace out for us and 10 for someone else. And nine of those 10 could be one through t- two through 10 for us. And the other guys got 11 through 20, except for number one. <laughs> the one that was really effing good went to that guy or one yeah. of those people in Texas. So you just have to understand that, oh, the, it's You're not the always that good. simple. Yeah, Somebody that has one store that does one barrel a year, there's a good chance they got a home run barrel. Yeah. And then there's nothing wrong with that. No, there's not. Well, Brad, again, thank you so much for coming on the show today. If people want to know more about you, how do they find out more about Liquor Barn? What's the best way to do that? Or Go Puff as well. Well, you can follow us all on social media. You can you can find me on social media really easy. Just send me a message so I know you're not like a serial killer <laughs> or, or something or a stalker. But uh, I will use. I, I tell you what, I have it's one more people. That you know, need it's, it's to a ask different time, bottles. right? I have some people that I call friends that I've only known because they picked up my Facebook account or Instagram account from some sort of Instagram show or something like this. And over time, we've talked about bourbon, talked about this, talked about tequila, and you end up knowing this person. Then you bump into them at a release or somewhere else. So, you know, look, you can find me at Bradford Williams, no R, because somebody else got that uh, on Instagram, or it's just Brad Williams in Kentucky and send me a message and you can follow me. It's not as interesting as it used to be because I felt like, like, how many times do I need to post a picture of me at Buffalo Trace or how many times do I need to, <laughs> right? You're just kind of uh, like, is, is this you. getting boring? Like, I got the same set of people I've had for two years. They've already seen this. So, Maybe I'll do more, but you can find me there. Get online, download the, download the GoPuff app. They have expanded their delivery range. Uh, they're out to my house over by Lime Kiln now, so you could, there's a lot of stuff on there. If you like candy, ice cream, diapers, wipes, uh, any of that stuff. No th- cannabis, though. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Not, Not yet. yet. Kentucky. Uh, Not yet in Kentucky. Once that happens, I'm in. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that in your liquor bar and just stop in and see us. We're all over the place. Awesome. Well, Brad, thank you again for coming on the no, show. Thanks, amazing. guys. I like love I, it. I, I gave you all the, yeah, the this plot was fascinating. Yeah, just to understand your psyche and everything that you've been doing and on the back end of, and again, broadening the rise in consumers. I think it's just a, amazing, and it's a good service that you're doing for people too. So thank you. Again, no, for doing that. I appreciate that. So make sure you check out Brad, check out GoPuff, check out Liquor Barn, all those great things. Make sure you also follow Bourbon Pursuit wherever you get your socials and give us a review. Give us a follow. Share it with a friend. It's the best way. People find out about great bourbon. People find out about great Catila. You know how? Because they share it with a friend. That's how you yep. find out about a great podcast as well. And stop in the liquor barn when you when you travel to Kentucky next. Because they actually have some of the best tasting bars out there they too. Do. Yes. Yeah. And dirt cheap prices. People, you come into the town, you're like, oh, I'm going to go to this restaurant. I'm going to go whatever. Be like, I guarantee if you want to try the widest selection of bourbon at a discounted price i mean i'd say discounted but it's it's at a fair price at a very fair price yep there it is fair price it's probably more than can, by the bottle but less than by the bar and if yes. you go to the one in springhurst you can go to target right afterward <laughs> uh, <laughs> and you know what or a lot of people goods. don't realize that springhurst is you can pop a cigar on the patio if you're that guy and you want to get a cigar of the humidor and walk outside and 
See, I tried to light up in the middle of the bourbon uh, room, <laughs> and I got kicked out. I still don't know what that's about. Hazardous. It's that's hazardous. Like, Do you know who I am? <laughs> they're like, who are you? You're like, Brad Williams. I'm like, oh, yeah. Sorry. Yes. No, so that's a, yeah, that's a lot of fun. And more and more, I see people out there kind of smoking cigars, having drinks, pint nights. Uh, I'm working on some stuff to get some some kind of names in there to do like a like a Friday night, this person behind the bar with their brand. So that's a, that's a fun store. Mm. Uh, staff there is great. If you know John Cecil, another young lady there named Hannah Jimenez knows a lot about tequilas and other things. So that's a that's a good store. Fantastic. So make sure you check out. That's another Cecil. You got to go and check out. Another variety yeah. of Cecils keep <laughs> popping up. Stare each other in the eyes. That's yeah. right. Are we related? <laughs> you have the same brown as my father. Are you brothers? Well, that's a good way to end it there, Fred. Yeah, so wrap it up before it gets creepy. <laughs> <laughs> so again, make sure you follow Brad, follow GoPuff, everything like that. Again, follow us. But cheers, everybody. We'll see you next week. <laughs>